So, hello everyone. Welcome to the Bangalore Theory Seminar Series. This week, we are delighted to have Max Hopkins as our guest speaker. Uh, Max is a PhD student in the Theory Group at UCSD, where he is advised by Daniel Kane and Shahar Lowet. His research interests lie in the area of uh, learning theory, computational geometry, combinatorics, approximation algorithms, and hardness of approximation. He's kindly agreed to give a talk on high dimensional expanders and hardness of approximation. So let's welcome Max and uh, all your guys. All right. Thanks so much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, HDX and, and hardness of approximation. Um, we're having a few technical issues, so please, if like something goes wrong with slides or something, please stop me and let me know. So I don't, you know, I have lectured before when slides were not moving, and please uh, let me know. Um, but if not, uh, let's go ahead. So this is based on uh, a series of joint works with uh, my wonderful collaborators, Mitali Bafna, uh, Jason Kadande, Tally Kaufman, Ting Chung Lin, Shahar Levitt, and Ruji Chang. Um, OK, uh, so I want to start off with uh, sort of an overview of uh, where we're going in this uh, talk. Um, mostly the talk will be about high dimensional expanders and a, a line of work towards applications to hardness of approximation. Uh, but to start off, uh, I should probably tell you at least what uh, an expander graph is. So uh, later I'll, I'll talk about uh, high dimensional expanders, but at least uh, at a very rough level, uh, what is an expander graph? What's sort of the basic notion of expansion? Uh, well, if you haven't heard of it before, expansion is roughly some kind of robust notion of connectivity in, in graphs. It's, it's usually considered in sort of sparse objects, and it's thought of as a way to mimic the type of connectivity structure that you see in the complete graph without having to be so dense. Uh, it's often useful to have sort of very few edges in, in many applications. Um, expansion is defined in a number of sort of, I wrote equivalent here, but really sort of only morally equivalent manners. Uh, there are notions uh, of spectral expansion that look at sort of the eigenvalues of uh, the adjacency matrix of a graph. There are more sort of combinatorial notions of expansion that look at uh, edge and vertex structure and, and how edges sort of expand uh, outwards. Um, but all of these notions have become sort of a, a very ubiquitous tool throughout theoretical computer science. They're used in across almost every sub area that I know of, I mean, classically in complexity, algorithms and coding theory, but also even areas outside of traditional uh, TCS, like combinatorics, uh, networks, uh, lots of different th stuff. Uh, so expanders have, have become, uh, you know, extremely popular objects throughout theoretical computer science. Uh, okay, but this talk is not about expander graphs. Uh, it's about uh, a recent trend that has looked at sort of extending the success of expander graphs in computer science to higher dimensions, to higher dimensional objects. These are things like uh, hypergraphs, but uh, also some more general objects, uh, several of which I'll, I'll talk about in the latter half of this talk. Um, and this has already seen uh, sort of great success throughout theoretical computer science. Uh, originally, this sort of, sort of started in approximate sampling with the resolution of what's called the Mihail Bazarani conjecture and led to a series of, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 works at this point and sort of breakthroughs on, on different types of approximate sampling and analysis of Markov chains. Uh, very recently, the type of uh, ideas behind high dimensional expansion have led to some breakthroughs in coding theory, in particular towards locally testable codes uh, and quantum uh, low density parity check codes. Uh, well, at least one of these we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, what I want to talk about today, I sort of have two overall goals for this talk. One is to try to explain some simple ideas in high dimensional expansion. And I know this can sound a little bit contradictory because the, the literature can get complicated in certain areas, especially in constructions. Um, but there are a lot, I think, of uh, really very simple, intuitive uh, notions and basic ideas in the theory of high dimensional expansion uh, that I think can uh, are easy to lose in, in sort of all the other details. I want to try to take some time to highlight these ideas. Uh, and then second, I want to sort of do this with an eye towards applications to hardness of approximation. Uh, and a little bit more concretely, I'll be talking about sort of two uh, topics in this direction. I'll be talking about uh, what are called spectral notions of high dimensional expansion, uh, generalizations of spectral expanders, uh, and towards sort of applications in Boolean function analysis, and eventually, uh, you know, hopefully with unique games conjecture. Uh, and second, a sort of related notion of what are, I guess, historically called topological high dimensional expanders. These are really generalizations of like edge or boundary type expansion to higher dimensions. Uh, and we'll see how these can be applied to uh, learn about what type of instances are hard for what's called the sum of squares semi-definite programming paradigm. Uh, okay, so that's sort of the overall plan. Uh, 
let's go ahead and, and jump into the first thing. So I want to start off with, uh, with motivation and not just jump right into sort of definitions on, on high dimensional expansion. Uh, but to do that, I actually do first have to introduce a notion of uh, expansion. The first notion we're going to see is something called edge expansion. Uh, so this is a very simple uh, fundamental combinatorial property of graphs. Given a graph uh, G and vertex set V and edge set E, the edge expansion of a subset of vertices just measures the proportion of edges that leave that subset. So it's just measuring sort of the fraction of edges that expand outwards from S. This is like number of edges from S to B without S uh, normalized in some fashion. Uh, and graphs where basically up to complement all sets have uh, pretty good edge expansion are one example of expander graphs. Uh, but one thing that has uh, come up as sort of a central tool in hardness of approximation uh, is analysis of structured objects that aren't expanders, but where it can still be very useful to sort of characterize which sets in your graphs expand, or maybe conversely, which sets in your graph don't expand. Um, originally, this was studied on the hypercube, uh, and the sort of seminal results by Konkali and Lineal and Friedgutz, uh, well, the KKL theorem and friedgutz hunter theorem. And very roughly speaking, uh, these can be thought of as sort of characterizations of non-expanding sets on the hypercube uh, that essentially say that if you are non-expanding, you must be uh, controlled by very few coordinates of the hypercube. You must be sort of very strongly local uh, in some sense. And these are really strong characterization theorems that have led to a lot of work in sharp threshold theorems and, and hardness of approximation and, and so on and so forth. Uh, these results are from sort of late 80s, early 90s. So since then, there's been sort of a lot of work uh, in this area. And in particular, uh, more recently, there's been a lot of interest in sort of understanding these type of characterization theorems on objects beyond the hypercube. So this includes sort of obvious extensions like uh, product spaces or even different measures on the hypercube, like the p bias cube, uh, but also sort of more uh, what are called exotic objects like slices of the hypercube, the Grossman, which sort of replaces things with vector space structure and linear algebraic structure, uh, or on the symmetric group and looking at sort of basic algebraic structure. And uh, these objects don't quite act like the hypercube does. You don't get quite as strong characterizations like the KKL theorem or friedgutz hunter theorem. But you do get uh, some sort of type of this uh, type of characterization that basically says that non-expanding sets have to be local in some sense. In other words, basically all of these examples have some sort of canonical local example of a set that doesn't expand for, for some sort of uh, obvious reason. And we'll see an example of this in, in not too long. Uh, and that as long as you sort of avoid this type of local set, as long as your, uh, your set is pseudo-random or, or global in some way, uh, then it will expand well, so uh, in, the, in the contrapositive, sort of any non-expanding set has to be concentrated within this local structure, has to be explained within this local structure. We'll call this sort of a KKL type theorem uh, throughout. And OK, so why should we care about this? Uh, and classically, these theorems led towards progress in hardness of approximation. Well, the new interest is largely driven towards a problem called the unique games conjecture, which is, uh, I think, sort of largely agreed to be the most important problem, uh, open problem in hardness of approximation. It basically posits the hardness of approximating some sort of simple uh, CSP, a constraint satisfaction problem called a unique game. The exact details don't really matter uh, for this talk. It's sort of just a motivating problem. And it's sort of long been known that characterizations of expansion, things like small set expansion, uh, are closely related to the unique games conjecture. And uh, back in 2018, we saw sort of a huge breakthrough uh, towards the UGC, uh, the first uh, sort of major one we've, we've seen. Uh, in the resolution of what is called the two-to-two -two games conjecture, which uh, roughly speaking, you can think of as just getting halfway to proving the UGC. Uh, and the reason that I bring this up is that the sort of the crucial component, the final piece of the proof uh, of this two-to-two uh, -two games conjecture was exactly this type of KKL type theorem on, uh, on the Grassman, on this type of uh, linear algebraic object. It was basically proved that sort of any non-expanding set has to be concentrated in some, in uh, inside some type of local structure. Uh, and this was used to prove the soundness of uh, some agreement tests in a PCP type reduction that, that finished the proof. But, but really somehow this was the crucial piece of information. We needed this structure theorem about uh, sort of non-expanding or sometimes called low total influence uh, functions on these more general objects. Okay, so this was about five years ago now. Uh, what has happened towards uh, since then? Well, uh, unfortunately, progress has been sort of largely stalled uh, in this direction, at least uh, to my knowledge. There are some sort of candidate directions for extending past two to two games and towards the unique games conjecture based on some things called the high degree short code graphs. They're sort of like generalizations of the Grossman to higher dimensions. Um, but to make any progress, it sort of requires a more general knowledge and, and 
uh, even a knowledge of sort of KKL type theorems on, on sparsified objects. There are some major issues with sort of basic extensions of this idea past the Grossman and past sort of uh, matrices, which is one way to think of, uh, of the Grossman graphs. And I think it's, it's fairly clear at this point that uh, in order to make progress in this direction, uh, we need sort of a more unified understanding of what is going on with these KKL type theorems. Uh, it's, if you look at sort of the different characterizations that uh, occur on all of these objects, they're all basically the same or very, very similar. And it seems like there is something uh, underlying going on here, that there should be some kind of framework that we can understand this through. Uh, but we sort of don't know yet. And, and what I want to talk about in, in this half of the talk uh, is sort of a line of work towards the question of whether uh, the idea of high dimensional expansion and high dimensional expanders can provide such a unified framework for understanding structure of non-expanding sets on, uh, on all of these objects. Uh, okay, and let me, this maybe sounds like uh, a bit crazy, uh, you know, just, uh, just hearing it for the first time. So let me, let me briefly say maybe a couple of reasons to believe why this would be true. Uh, the first, which is something that I'll explain in more detail uh, in a couple minutes, is that basically all known examples of these types of characterizations are on some type of good high dimensional expander, whether it is uh, the hypercube, which is uh, some type of perfect one-sided high dimensional expander, or the Grossman, which is a, a very highly expanding object on, on vector spaces. Um, another point is that we actually already know that it leads to a, a weaker type of characterization, a related characterization about uh, spectral expansion of these objects. Um, and you can view this question as sort of a, a question about whether something stronger holds and sort of these spectral characterizations, which have basically led to this line of breakthroughs in approximate sampling. One way of viewing this is sort of asking for a stronger type of, of characterization than what's known in this direction. And finally, uh, I'll note that sort of uh, actually the reason that uh, this type of spectral high dimensional expander that I'll define was introduced in this literature in the first place was exactly towards uh, proving sparsified versions of, of agreement tests, which is sort of one of the things we need to look for towards uh, the UGC. Um, and we sort of actually already know that these objects do lead to sparsified agreement tests, uh, at least in some uh, in, in sort of certain settings. OK, so this is sort of the, the broad motivation. Um, now I want to tell you what a high dimensional expander is. I've sort of gone so far by just uh, being, being vague about it. Uh, so we'll focus on sort of a special case in this talk on what are called pure simplicial complexes. And this is basically just jargon, meaning downward closed hypergraph. That's really all this is. So a, a pure simplicial complex, uh, x, is made up of uh, sets of sort of each dimension from 0 to k where xk is just a k-uniform hypergraph. It's a set, a family of k sets of 1 through n. And each xi is just given by downward closure of that k set. So xi includes all i sets that are subsets of your top level faces. And you can sort of draw it out in this diagram like this. I've given an example here of a, a case where k is equal to 3. This is, we have triangles at our top level. And we've included just by downward closure sets of all sizes going down. So this is what I mean by a, a simplicial complex or a pure simplicial complex. Uh, and very roughly, we'll say that X uh, is a high dimensional expander, a, a hypergraph or a simplicial complex, pardon, is a high dimensional expander. Basically, if each local part of the complex uh, is an expander graph, it's like a standard expander graph. And I'll explain in slightly more detail what I mean by this in, in just a second. Um, and why is this a reasonable notion? You know, why would I want to define my complex to be a high dimensional expander if sort of I can break it up into local parts that are, that are uh, standard expanders? Well, the main idea, which sort of occurs everywhere throughout the literature on, on high dimensional expansion and has basically led to, as far as I know, every single one of the break, breakthroughs that we've seen via high dimensional expansion NCS, uh, is something called the local to global paradigm, where basically the idea is that on these type of complexes, if you want to analyze a global property like uh, testability or just to understand some function on, on the complex, say on triangles of the complex, one thing that you can do is break that function down into restrictions onto local parts of the complex. And then you can use the fact that every local part is an expander to do some type of analysis on local parts of the functions, and then lift this back to sort of the global property you want to prove on the complex. At a rough level, of course, I'm sweeping many things under the rug, but at a rough level, this is how many, many of the results in high dimensional expansion work. And this is sort of why things are defined this way, uh, at least in this, uh, in this notion of high dimensional expansion. Uh, so now let me be a little bit more detailed. What do I mean by local components? So these are things that are called uh, links uh, in, in the high dimensional expansion literature. They're basically just restrictions, more or less. So every every I set or I face in the in the complex has what's called a, a link, which is basically the subcomplex associated to that uh, set. Uh, 
So the formal definition of this is basically you look at everything in the complex. So say we want to find the link of S, some, some face S. We look in the complex at everything that contains S, and then we'll remove S. And this gives us a lower dimensional complex. Um, this is much easier to see pictorially. So let's look at sort of a, an example of this. Let's say we want to look at what the link of the vertex 1 is. So like I said, the first thing that we'll do is we'll highlight everything that contains 1. Hopefully, this is showing as red on your screen, and I'm seeing the same thing that, that uh, you guys are. Uh, so the idea is we highlight everything that contains uh, S, which is 1 here. And then we will just remove. So now uh, to get to a simplicial complex, what we need to do is remove the common element. We need to remove 1. And this lowers the dimension by 1. And in this case, it gives us a graph. Right? When we move from this sort of x1, x2, x3, when we subtract one thing, we move down to having the empty set vertices and edges. And this is just a graph. right? And in particular, this in this example, this is the complete graph on three vertices. This is a copy of k3. We have vertices you know, 2, 3, 4, and edges 2, 3, 2, 4, 3, 4. So uh, this would sort of suggest that this original object I showed you, which is called the complete complex, should be a very good high dimensional expander, because all of its local restrictions, all of its links, are complete graphs which are, OK, not sparse, but are very, very good expanders in, in sort of a formal sense. Um, OK, so uh, the last thing I need to tell you is what it means to be an expander. I've said all the local parts need to be expanders. I haven't told you what I mean by an expander yet. So uh, this, uh, this notion that I'm talking about is called local spectral expansion. Uh, it's an extension of spectral expanders to high dimensions. So very briefly, so let's review what is a, a spectral question, Yeah. if you're OK. Sorry, I can't see questions, so please just interrupt yeah. me. Uh, no, no, it's I have a question. Uh, so yeah. can you go to the previous slide once? Yeah. So you say that this eventual graph that you get by removing one from each of these faces, so uh, that gives you this, if you look at this graph 2, 3, 4 in the original complex, it doesn't look like a local thing of uh, vertex 1. So why do you say it's a local thing? Uh, I mean, th this is the, the part of the complex that corresponds to restricting to one, right? This is like, uh, th th this is the, like the way that you'll define functions, for instance, on this restriction mm -hmm. is like the, the value of, or, or one way to do it is you, is you say like the value of F of two, three on sort of the link of one if f is a function on three phases, will just be the value of f one two three. It's sort of it's sort of just a way of uh, restricting the the complex to parts that are relevant to a certain face. Right? These are sort of the parts of the com like in in the back of your head, you can still sort of pretend that one is here, but this is sort of the structure of the complex that is relevant to the vertex one. I think is one way to to think about it. Um, a more yeah, technical way is that Garland's method works like this. <laughs> But that's sort of not a very good answer. Um, but I, I think the correct way to think of it is this: this is really the relevant structure. Like what what we're really going to care about doing in, is we'll look at, for instance, like random walks on on k sets of the graph, and you want to decompose this into sort of local uh, sorry k sets of the of the hypergraph, and you want to decompose this onto sort of local random walks just on graphs, and it, it sort of turns out that on complexes, the one uh, or often the right way to decompose this is you look at sort of the global walk can sort of be decomposed into sort of uh, local walks on these on these link graphs uh, that that are being displayed here. That's sort of the best answer I think I can I can give. Yeah, that's a good question. Definitely. It's also, by the way, not not obvious that uh, this is necessarily like the right notion. High dimensional expansion is a very new field. I think it is a right notion, um, and I think it makes sense for simplicial complexes especially. But uh, when you move to other things like the Grossman, for instance, uh, this is maybe not the only right notion of sort of locality and how to divide up your function on the complex. So it's, it's a very good question. Mm -hmm. OK, um, OK, yeah, again, sorry, I should have said this at the start. I, I cannot really see people because uh, of some technical issues. I can see like one person. So please just stop me if you have uh, questions and you know unmute and, and, and ask. Otherwise, I can't really tell. Um, OK, so uh, going back to sort of the, the definition here, uh, we'll say something is a local spectral expander, roughly if, if every local part is a spectral expander. But let me, uh, to make sure everyone's on the same page, let me remind you what a spectral expander is. So uh, we'll focus on the regular case for simplicity. You can generalize this to arbitrary graphs. Uh, let's say G is a regular graph, and it has normalized adjacency matrix A. 
because A is a symmetric graph and is doubly stochastic. It has a spectral decomposition whose eigenvalues are between one and negative one. And in particular, the first eigenvalue will always be one. It corresponds to the constant function. This is sort of the trivial part. Um, and we call a graph G, a gamma spectral expander, uh, essentially, if all of the non-trivial eigenvalues, everything below lambda 1, it's small and absolute value. Um, now, I'll say that if you're not familiar with spectral graph theory, uh, this is a bit of a mysterious definition. Um, and uh, because this talk is mostly on high dimensional expansion, I'm going to be taking this sort of on faith. And I'll say that if you haven't seen this before, you should just think of it as a way that one mimics the structure of the complete graph. That this is basically some way of saying spectrally, and this does transfer over to sort of distribution of edges and things like this, your graph looks like the complete graph in some sense. Um, OK, so now we can actually define uh, what is a high dimensional expander, what is uh, something called a local spectral expander introduced by Denner and Kaufman. So we'll call a, a simplicial complex a gamma local spectral expander. It basically, for every uh, link of co-dimension at least two, every link who sort of has enough dimensions to be a graph, uh, at least a graph, uh, and every face, the link uh, sort of uh, uh, the link of every face of sufficient dimension in your complex, uh, the graph underlying it is a gamma spectral expander, right? So in the example that I looked at earlier, I was only looking at sort of one dimension down. So when I took the link, it automatically gave me a graph. But in general, it will give me a subcomplex. So I, I have to sort of cut off things above edges and, and look at the graph structure on that. So that's sort of the notion of high dimensional expansion. Uh, at, again, sort of at an intuitive level, I think you should really just think about this as sort of a complex or a hypergraph as a high dimensional expand, a high dimensional expander. If for every sort of uh, conditional restriction, if every restriction you look at, look at in the complex looks like the complete graph in some sense, that's sort of a fine way to think about it for the moment. Uh, if you're more familiar with the expansion literature, each local part is a spectral expander. Is the is the exact definition. OK, so uh, at this point, uh, you could reasonably still be fairly confused about what any of this has to do with the KKL type theorems that I was talking about before in terms of the motivation, in particular because these KKL type theorems were statements about graphs. They weren't statements about complexes. You know, they were statements about sort of expansion on uh, the hypercube graph of, of Hamming distance one or, or, or something like this. So why am I talking about these complexes? Well, I don't care about the complexes uh, in and of themselves. What I actually care about are a series of random walks on the complexes that sort of uh, generate a family of, of graphs. So in particular, uh, uh, expander graphs and sort of the success of expander graphs has largely been driven by their association with the underlying random walk on the graph. In particular, this is just the standard walk where you start at like a vertex of your graph, and then you move to, say, a neighbor uniformly at, at random. And OK, there's some exact definition here, but this is sort of just the basic walk you would take on a, on a graph. Uh, in 2016, Kaufman and Mass noticed that there are sort of obvious ways to generalize this type of walk to complexes. There are sort of obvious high dimensional analogs of these walks on simplicial complexes and, and other types of objects. Where if you view things in sort of this complex viewpoint that we were looking at before, the way to view this sort of uh, standard vertex walk would be that you started an element in x1, say 1, and then you walk to an adjacent one of its edges, say 1, 4, and then you walk back down the complex to an adjacent vertex. So right in that example, I would walk to 1 to 4, and it's just like I'm doing sort of the standard walk on the graph. Kaufman and Mass noticed that there's no reason that you have to do this only at sort of level one of your complex. You could also walk between edges of the complex via a shared triangle, right? As is highlighted here, I could walk from one, four to the triangle one, three, four, uh, and back down to three, four. And this would give me sort of an analog of the standard random walk uh, that's usually on sort of vertices of a graph to edges of, say, a simplicial complex. And I can do this on any level, right? I can walk between k sets uh, via a, a shared k plus one set or something like this. And uh, these are called higher order random walks. And we now finally get to uh, sort of the base reason for why high dimensional expanders uh, are sort of an interesting object to look at as a potential unifying theory for this type of KKL theory. Uh, and the reason is that these walks on high dimensional expanders turn out to capture a, a huge amount of structure, almost oh, sort of a, a shocking amount of structure throughout theoretical computer science. Uh, there are basic ways where you can view these as if you embed the hypercube as a complex, you can look at the hypercube graph and the noisy hypercube graph and sort of all these classical objects studied in Boolean function analysis can be written this way. Uh, what's written above is technically the Johnson graphs, if you've heard of these. And if you replace sort of these sets with a uh, vector space structure, what you get are the Grossman graphs, which are exactly what we were interested in understanding uh, for the 2 to 2 games conjecture and going beyond the 2 to 2 games conjecture. Uh, 
Uh, if you're familiar with the approximate sampling literature, basically all of these breakthroughs have come from the observation that what are called Glauber dynamics, which is like a, a standard type of uh, Markov chain or mixing dynamics on like icing models are also exactly this type of higher order random walk. You can analyze them via high dimensional expansion. So basically all of these breakthroughs and, and the reason why uh, you might think that HDX can give uh, hopefully a framework for this type of KKL type theorem uh, is via these higher order random walks, via the fact that uh, these walks basically capture sort of, as far as we know, all, all of the structures, uh, you know, the graphs that, that satisfy this type of characterization theorem that we're interested in. Um, okay, maybe I'll pause briefly. Are there are there questions about sort of the definitions here, either of local spectral expanders or, or the walks before I sort of talk about uh, results? Okay, great. If not, then let's talk. Oh, yeah. yeah, I don't see any questions in chat as well, so yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for checking. Yeah, I cannot. I cannot see that. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and ask uh, sort of the question we posed at the beginning, the motivating question. Uh, can we characterize uh, the what non-expanding sets or, or what sort of sets expand on these walks on high-dimensional expanders? Now, to simplify things, I'm going to cheat a little bit, and I'm going to I'm going to talk about something called the small set expansion regime. I mean, I'm, I'm going to focus on a particular higher order random walk that corresponds in Boolean function analysis to what is called the noise operator, T1 half. And this is basically just the walk that looks at a K set. It starts at a K set, and it sort of independently at random resamples each vertex with probability a half of your K set. So on the hypercube, this is a little bit easier to think of. You have an n bit string that has some values, 0, 1. You go through each one independently, and you resample 0 or 1 with probability a half. So this is the analog of, of what's called the noise operator or the noisy uh, hypercube graph uh, on, on complexes. And in this case, sort of the analogous uh, characterization of expansion on, on the hypercube that we're interested in sort of mimicking or understanding is that uh, very famously, uh, the noisy hypercube graph. Uh, question is, Max, uh, like yeah. about this noise operator. So, so like, uh, do you want to say you get the bits that you get one, you want to jump to that phase? Or what do you want to do? With, uh, you, you say something about that? Maybe I mean, You're saying how does the resampling work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm being I'm I'm being a bit informal here. This is technically a affine combination, or sorry, a, a like binomial combination of lower walks. And the way you should technically think about it is what I'm going to do is I'm first going to pick a a binomial draw from like uh, so how many I, faces I'm going to resample, and then the I'm going to. Like, what would you do with the the sampling? What do you do with that? This like, is how you define it. This is like defining the edge structure of the graph. Is that what you mean? This is defining the weights of like if I want to if I want to understand what's the like what's the probability in my Markov chain or my weighted graph of moving from K set oh, okay. one to K set two. Okay, okay. I see. I see. I'm looking at the probability of moving between them in this random resampling process. I see. I see. Is that that's what you mean? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So this is defining a Markov chain, which is equivalent to like a weighted. So these are actually weighted graphs. These aren't like a. I was for simplicity. I was doing everything as sort of regular unweighted graphs. Uh, these aren't actually in in practice regular and un unweighted. They're a bit more complicated than that. Um, uh, yeah. So this is just defining the edge structure of of the graph. Um, okay. And sort of the relevant question here in terms of expansion uh, on the hypercube. There's a famous result uh, also in the in the original work of KKL uh, called noise sensitivity of the of the hypercube or uh, small set expansion of the noisy hypercube graph which basically says that uh, small sets on the noisy hypercube graph expand near perfectly. So the first question to ask here is that on complexes, on high dimensional expanders, uh, do small sets expand near perfectly? Um, and the answer is sort of emphatically no, they don't. Uh, there's a very natural obstruction to this, which is exactly this type of link structure that we were talking about before. Uh, technically, these are restrictions. You don't actually remove the thing that you're restricting to in this example. Uh, so let's sort of consider the most basic example and see why. Let's consider this set S1 of K sets. That's every K set that contains the vertex one. So the first thing to notice is that let's just say we're on the complete hypergraph. We have all K sets of, of N. S1 is a very small set, right? There are about N to the K total K faces of your N things, really N choose K. And once we restrict to having one in our set, now we have K minus one choices. So that there are about N to the K minus one over N to the K. It's really like K over N. Uh, but the point is that this is a very small density set. And sort of as n goes to infinity, the size of the set is going to zero very, very fast. Um, and sort of if you had the theorem that small sets expanded, you would expect the expansion of this graph to be really, really good uh, of this subset. You would expect that almost all edges are leaving the subset because of how small it is. Uh, 
But you can see directly that this isn't true. Because if, if, our, if our weighted graph is given by resampling every vertex with probability 1 half, what's sort of the probability that we expand outwards? One way to think about the edge expansion is if you sort of look at the random walk version, the edge expansion is the probability that you leave the set upon applying uh, the random walk. Well, the probability that we leave this set that's everything that contains 1, sort of like a dictator, is about a half. Right, because the only way we leave this set is that we resample one. It doesn't matter what we do to the rest of the vertices. It's it's totally uh, it's totally independent. All that matters is this one half choice in the first thing, and so the expansion is about a half, maybe a half minus low L of one or or something like that. And this is sort of uh, an obstruction to expansion that doesn't occur in the hypercube. This is a different type of type of structure, um, and so the the natural question then becomes: uh, Is this the only problem? Can we explain all non-expanding sets? by this type of local structure. And this is sort of what a KKL type theorem would be. Towards this end, we'll call a function that is not concentrated in any link, so a function that is not correlated with any of these local structures. And we'll call it pseudo-random. Sometimes you'll see this called global uh, in the literature. So uh, I guess a little bit more technically, uh, if we have a function over, over k sets, we'll call it epsilon pseudo-random at level i, if on all restrictions, its density is at most epsilon. So if you sort of look at any low-level restriction in the complex, the function looks like it's sparse. It looks, uh, you know, it's it's very far from being this like dictator example. Um, and what we prove, which is uh, this KKL type theorem on high dimensional expanders, uh, is basically that this is in fact true. That as long as you are far away from being local in this sense, as long as you are far away from being a link, then you are near perfectly expanded. So in other words, if you're on a, sort of a sufficiently good high dimensional expander. Uh, and you're a pseudo-random set, you're not uh, correlated with any local structure, you're not correlated in any link, then your expansion is about uh, 1 minus epsilon to the O of 1, maybe 1 minus epsilon to the 1 third or something like that. And you can think about epsilon as sort of going to 0, meaning that these are almost perfectly expanding sets. And the useful thing here is the contrapositive. This is what makes it sort of a KKL type theorem and a characterization of expansion. Because what this says is that if you give me a non-expanding set, I can tell you it has to be concentrated somewhere inside the complex. Right? I can tell you that this function has to be local. Somewhere it has to have constant density uh, inside some restriction in the complex. Uh, and, and this is sort of the type of theorem that is very, very useful in PCP type reductions and agreement testing and, and, and things like this. And that on the Grossman, which is not a simplicial object, uh, was what led to sort of the 2 to 2 games conjecture. But uh, this is a more sort of general notion that captures, uh, OK, in this, in this particular instantiation, it doesn't exactly capture products, but there's a version by Gerlifschitz and Lou that, that does. This can sort of be thought of as generalizing the known theorems from product spaces and slices and a few other objects and, and extending them to a much broader range. Um, but there are uh, some caveats here, or maybe some, some open problems for, for future research, which is, uh, at least with respect to sort of the unique games conjecture, what we're really interested in is sort of non-simplicial structure, right? I, I told you at the very beginning that I'm only working over these simplicial objects. Uh, and I did that for a very important reason. This theorem only holds, as far as we know, over simplicial objects. So this is sort of a major caveat in that if we are sort of hoping to make progress towards unique games conjecture, we need to understand this type of structure more broadly on uh, you know, sort of vector space analogs and, and more general underlying structures than just uh, sort of downward closed hypergraphs or simplicial complexes. The second that I'll mention is that this requires very strong uh, expansion guarantees, uh, in particular, sort of uh, the actual like local spectral parameters throughout the entire complex have to be really, really good. It sort of doesn't say anything about weak high dimensional expanders. And these objects exist, the sort of known algebraic constructions, uh, sort of the Kaufman-Oppenheim coset complex construction, Ramanujan complexes, these all do satisfy this. So it's certainly a non-trivial theorem. And it uh, sort of for the first time gives this type of understanding on sparse objects, which is interesting. But it doesn't hold for sort of all types of objects we'd hope for. For instance, the symmetric group is a good example of something that still is a simplicial complex that you can phrase as a simplicial complex that is a high dimensional expander, but it's not a good enough high dimensional expander to satisfy this definition. So even though we sort of know, we actually know this theorem that I have stated here, this is true on, on the symmetric group. It has been proved separately, but it is not sort of captured under this unified framework yet because of this issue. And I think it would, it would be really interesting to sort of figure out uh, if you can prove these theorems for maybe complexes with uh, sort of arbitrary, arbitrary expansion guarantees, uh, like the type of things in Alev Lau and that are used in sampling a lot. Um, so there's, there's still a lot to do here. There's some, uh, there's some work in this direction on both of these problems, uh, extending things to what are called expanding posets, which include things like the Grossman, 
or to weak, uh, weak simplicial high dimensional expanders. Uh, but all of them sort of still have the caveat that they only work in low dimensions. Um, and again, sort of, uh, I mean, this is still non-trivial, but sort of the very interest in the regime, the, the, the really like uh, gold thing we're hoping for to try to really make progress towards uh, UGC or other problems at hardness of approximation, uh, is that we, we sort of need this to be non-trivial as dimension scales to infinity. Um, I don't really have time to go in why. This is sort of how the PCP reductions work. Um, so there's still sort of a lot, to, a lot to do here. This is really sort of only, uh, we only have sort of a base understanding of what's going on. I think there's a reasonable amount of hope to get these things to work, um, but there's, there's a lot to be done. Um, okay, let me mention very quickly sort of two key ideas that go into proving this theorem that I think are uh, also just sort of generically useful. Um, one, I, I won't talk about much, but uh, basically all of these types of results are based upon a theory of FOIA analysis on high dimensional expanders. I, I won't go too deeply into this because giving a talk on FOIA analysis would be like an entirely separate talk uh, and I don't have time to go into it. But the basic idea is that uh, high dimensional expanders have some very nice bases that you can talk about. And in particular, it's possible to sort of divide up a function into contributions coming from different levels of the complex. So you can sort of, if you have a function on K sets, you can sort of talk in some formal way about the contribution to this function coming from level i. And if you're familiar with Fourier analysis on the cube, this is basically like the size i Fourier coefficients. This is what sort of is the, the, the natural analog. And it should satisfy some properties like these should be approximately orthogonal. The really important thing, at least in the regime of, of strong high dimensional expansion, is that these should sort of almost be eigenvectors for these blocks that we care about. And this lets you sort of turn all of this uh, combinatorial expansion type structure into statements about sort of understanding these bases and understanding uh, spectral structure and, and structure of higher moments of, of these bases, tools like uh, hypercontractivity, which is some sort of smoothness statements about low degree functions in FOIA bases, um, this sort of general idea. If, uh, you know, if you don't have much background in this, uh, it's, it's not that important that uh, this be understood, but this is one of the major tools in sort of this area. And there's this developing theory of, of FOIA analysis on HDX that's been very useful. Uh, the second thing that I want to mention that I think is, is, a, is a little bit simpler, uh, and I actually think is, is a very intuitive way to think about high dimensional expanders, uh, especially if you're not so familiar with like spectral expansion and notions like this. Um, the reason that moving to high dimensional expanders was difficult um, in the type of KKL type theorem from, from product spaces and similar objects is that these old methods, especially those using FOIA analysis, really relied really strongly on your object looking like a product on sort of the variables being independent from each other and being able to sort of move them around freely and condition on things without worrying about affecting the rest of the, the product space. Uh, this was sort of seemed very crucial uh, in, these, in these proofs. And this was a problem because on high dimensional expanders, uh, they can really be very, very far from products. And, and this is actually very easy to see because you could have a complex, for instance, that has N vertices, but where every vertex is only contained in a constant number of top level faces. This is called a bounded degree complex. It's one of sort of the big things in, in high dimensional expansion constructing these uh, and they exist. And the point here is that if you have this type of structure, the marginal probability on your vertices might look like one over N, but as soon as you condition on, on another vertex, right, the number of K, the, the size of the object, the size of the conditioned object goes down to being constant, right? There are only 10 K phases that include X2. And so your probability jumps from being like one over n to either being like zero or a 10. Right? So this doesn't look like a product at all. It, 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 there are these massive dependencies between variables in these subsets, and that makes it hard to work with. This was sort of the main challenge. And really the core idea of, of getting around this and that I think is uh, really should be very broadly useful is the idea that while high dimensional expanders uh, at a point-wise sense can't look like products, uh, sort of by definition, because they, they're sparse, uh, they are somehow close to products on average. Um, and what do I mean by this? Well, basically, uh, while at an, in a, in an individual level, they don't look like products, somehow if I'm analyzing a type of expected quantity, like uh, a, a moment, like a fourth moment or a variance or, or something like this, the way that these dependencies work cancel out with each other. Um, and there's a formal way to state this. I don't want to exactly go through it. The idea is that if you look at the conditional expectation of some restriction of a function versus this global expectation. It's controlled by something with small spectral norm. That's uh, sort of exactly what the statement is. But roughly what this means is that when you're, when you're analyzing high dimensional expanders, when you're sort of working with uh, expected type quantities, roughly speaking, you can just pretend that your object is a product. You can pretend that variables are independent and uh, 
up to sort of error terms in the spectral parameters, everything is going to be okay. That's sort of the moral uh, of, of this story that high dimensional uh, expanders, if you're, if you're analyzing an average or an expectation, they act like they're independent. They act like they're products. And, and one thing that I think is, is really interesting and, it, and it's sort of a, a nice way to understand what it means to be a local spectral expander. And this maybe even goes back to sort of, uh, you know, why we've defined links in this certain way and the, the question from earlier. Um, this is actually an exactly equivalent notion to local spectral expansion. In particular, you can define equivalently a high dimensional expander to be a distribution over K sets of some hypergraph, which acts independent on average, where in some formal average case sense, no matter how I sort of condition on things within the, within the K sets, no matter how I condition on some subset of variables, as long as I'm analyzing an expectation, everything looks independent. Uh, this is like an equivalent way to define high dimensional expansion. Um, Okay, so I need to move on because I want to talk a little bit about topological notions of high-dimensional expansion and, and solid squares as well. I know I'm running Let's, out of time. Um, yeah, just a slide. Uh, yeah, so this remark here that HDX are like distribution of k Can we think of this like a higher order analog of this uh, local global correlation kind of thing in graphs? Uh, like you mean like the, the sum of squares what type I, rounding local to global correlation stuff? Or? No, I mean like for an expander graph if you are uh, locally correlated, you expect to be globally correlated. Yeah, yes, 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 exactly. That's exactly what this is. Yeah. I, see. I mean, th this, that is, that is quite literally what this is. Like I didn't write out gamma here, but gamma is basically exactly this local versus global correlation. On, you look at like the random walk operator minus the expectation operator. You say that has false spectral norm that yes, that's exactly what this is. hundred percent. It's not a complicated statement. This is a very simple lemma to, to prove, uh, but I think it's very powerful. Um, it, it basically gives that high dimensional viewpoint on this. Uh, okay, unless there are any other questions, uh, I want to move on to sort of the second part and talking a, a little bit about topological high dimensional expanders and their relation to this. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and move forward. So yeah, uh, again, questions. yeah, yeah, question? Yeah, no questions on chat as well. So no questions, okay. Um, okay, so uh, very briefly, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the sum of squares STP hierarchy. This is very basically, a, it's a very powerful algorithmic paradigm for combinatorial optimization. I'm not going to talk about uh, too much about exactly what the details of, of this are. Uh, it's, a, it's a hierarchy of semi-definite programs of levels sort of ranging between 2 and n. And these are basically just semi-definite programming relaxations of a certain combinatorial problem, maybe like a constraint satisfaction problem that uh, roughly sort of look at the teeth level. You sort of look at uh, sets of sort of assignments of up to T local variables at, at once. Um, so out of your total N variables, you're sort of allowed to look at T things at once along with some sort of low degree local consistency checks. So at a very rough level, uh, think of this as sort of a type of algorithm that has like low degree consistency and is only allowed to sort of locally look at T things at once. At sort of the teeth level of the, uh, of the variables. That's all we'll need to know for the moment. Um, it's a very, very powerful uh, hierarchy. It gives uh, the best known algorithms for uh, constraint satisfaction approximation, which I'll define in just a second, uh, including sort of, I, I, as far as I know, sort of all the best algorithms for unique games uh, towards sort of uh, refuting the UGC and various uh, cases where unique games are actually easy are typically proved through uh, sort of what are called rounding algorithms on sum of squares. Uh, and I mean, uh, the, the framework has tons of connections to the unique games conjecture. It's also known that sort of these uh, basic CSP approximation relaxations are optimal under the unique games conjecture. Um, it's a very, very closely connected topic to uh, the UGC. And uh, honestly, most work within the past 10 or 15 years on the UGC has been related somehow to this sum of squares paradigm, understanding what is hard, what is easy for, for sum of squares. And this is a, a, a very related question to, to unique games. Um, okay, let me uh, remind you, what is a constraint satisfaction problem, just so we can set this up. Uh, a CSP, uh, very, very basically, uh, is just like a set of variables, x1 through xn, and a set of constraints to be satisfied on those variables. We're going to assume we're over like a Boolean alphabet, so these variables take on value 0 or 1. And these constraints could be things like a sat, you know, 3 sat, or, or xor, like mod 2 sum has to be 1, or what are called unique games that I haven't formally introduced in this talk. but. This is some very natural set of, uh, of problems that sum of squares is very powerful for. Uh, 
Um, and we'll say that a, a family of constraint satisfaction problems is hard for the sum of squares paradigm, is, is hard to approximate for SOS. Uh, if it satisfies these two properties, if it uh, satisfies soundness, which means that the CSPs uh, actually cannot be satisfied. So, uh, oh, sorry, I, I forgot to say that the value of a CSP is the maximum fraction of satisfiable constraints. You look at all the possible assignments, the variables XI, and you look at the maximum fraction of, of the constraints in the CSP are satisfied, and that's its value. So a CSP is said to be hard to approximate, a family of CSPs, uh, if that family is far from satisfiable, meaning that its value is sort of bounded away from one. It's uh, like only a constant fraction of constraints are satisfiable. Uh, and it's complete, which essentially means that sum of squares thinks that it is satisfiable. It sort of looks satisfiable to the STP relaxation. Uh, and that means its STP value is, is one. Like it thinks the real value of the, of the constraint satisfaction problem uh, is the same as if it were satisfiable. It sort of can't tell between the two. Uh, you know, again, this is sort of a, at a rough level, but that's all I have time to go into. And the main motivating question here uh, is to ask, you know, given that sum of squares is so uh, directly tied to unique games, uh, what type of structure is hard for sum of squares? We'd like to understand, uh, you know, given that this is sort of the main paradigm towards algorithms for unique games and indeed all CSPs, it would be nice to understand uh, at, a, at a finer grain level what types of things are hard for, for this paradigm. Now, the classical answer to this is that random CSPs are hard. There's an asterisk here because uh, your CSP has to sort of be nice enough for this to apply. But there's a, there's a very, very long line of work uh, on this direction. I'll just be talking about some of the early seminal works uh, in particular on uh, a, a problem called XOR or three XOR, which is just mod two sum as constraints. So uh, let me be a little bit more specific about what I mean here. Let's consider the following constraint satisfaction problem or XOR instance that's defined, whose structure is defined by a bipartite graph. This is a very classical way to define a constraint satisfaction problem. It's also related to like Tanner codes if you're from the, the coding theory community. Uh, and okay, all this is, is that you have a set of variables at the bottom uh, here, x1 through x6, and you have a set of constraints at the top. And the structure of the constraints is just given by the sum over its neighboring variables, right? So an example here, the constraint structure of C2 is x1 plus x3 plus x5. That's all that's going on here. There's nothing complicated. So to turn this into a CSP, we now, we now need to assign to each of these structure uh, a bit, right? This sum needs to be one or it needs to be zero. And so uh, to finish the CSP, we'll look at a function on level x1. So we'll look at a, a 0, 1 assignment to each one of these c1, c2, c3, c4. And this gives us an XOR instance, right? We'll call it x beta, uh, which is just the family of these constraints, ci equals beta. So nothing complicated here. Just a very simple way of defining CSPs. Now, what Gregoriev and, and Shoanebeck independently proved is that if your underlying bipartite graph is a good expander, is a good sort of edge expander, or what's called a boundary expander, and you pick the assignment to beta randomly, that this is hard for the sum of squares paradigm, basically optimally hard, that you have to go all the way up to like linear levels of SOS to be able to find the contradiction, for, to be able to uh, refute this problem. Um, and uh, roughly speaking, why is this the case? Well, you can imagine that because I'm picking beta randomly, if I have a fixed assignment to variables, the probability for each individual constraint that I'm going to pick the right bit is one half. Right? And so by a turnoff bound and union bound, you can argue that sort of with very high probability, uh, always about half the constraints are going to be violated. So this is the CSP that's very far from satisfiable with high probability. And yet, in some sense, due to the expansion, due to the fact that sort of uh, locally the graph sort of doesn't turn in on itself in a way, it's very hard to find contradictions. Even though like uh, only half of things are satisfiable, if you only look at local structure, uh, because of sort of boundary expansion and, and the way that right, the way you would find a contradiction is by some of, sort of summing up these equations until you get one equals zero. And the idea is that sort of because you're expanding uh, and, and very, you, you basically have to see many variables before you can find this type of contradiction at a very rough level uh, because of the randomness of beta and the expansion of the underlying graph. And, and so this is uh, sort of traditionally uh, what we know to be hard for, for sum of squares. But um, OK, this is nice, but it's a little bit unsatisfying because uh, we had to rely on randomness here. And, and uh, at some level, this doesn't really tell us exactly what the hard structure for sum of squares really looks like, other than that, OK, random things are hard for, for SOS. And so it, it's been wondered for a while whether we can find actual explicit examples, uh, maybe sort of de-randomizations of this construction uh, that remain hard for sum of squares to try to find some sort of structure uh, you know, structural understanding of, of, of what is hard. Um, 
And uh, the idea, which was uh, actually due to Diderot, Filmus, Harsha, and Solsiani, was basically to replace randomness with high dimensional structure. Uh, and so uh, roughly speaking, the idea is that instead of just uh, like a two-part bipartite graph, we're gonna look at sort of a three-part graph. We're gonna look at sort of stacked bipartite graphs where the top level stands for some sort of added global constraints or, or global checks uh, that the that your choice of, of beta on level uh, on level x1, your choice of values for each of the constraints has to satisfy. So, okay, in slightly more detail, how do we wanna pick beta? We wanna pick some beta now that satisfies all the global checks. So these are, uh, are the same way, like if, uh, this check right here just says that the values I pick on these vertices has to sum to zero, the XOR should be zero. So it has to satisfy these global checks uh, and it has to be unsatisfiable, right? In fact, it has to be very unsatisfiable. It has to be sort of bounded away from one. Uh, and, and sort of the hope was that if somehow this underlying stacked high dimensional bipartite graph structure, if this is a high dimensional expander in some sense, you know, maybe we'll get this structure. Maybe the instances will be hard, which at face value seems maybe a little bit hard to believe, uh, but indeed it turns out to be true. Uh, in particular, uh, Diner, Filmus, Harsha, and Tulsiani managed to prove hardness against uh, root log n levels of sum of squares by using a classical construction of high dimensional expanders called simplicial complexes. Um, now root log n is not very good. Uh, the, the reason was that the particular type of construction they use and particular simplicial objects in general uh, sort of don't have the right properties for this, but it was the right idea. Uh, and recently in, in, in joint work with Ting Chung Lin, we basically showed how to finish this line of work, that uh, if you sort of replace the Ramanujan complex with a more general object called an expanding chain complex, uh, then you can basically recover the asymptotically the hardness of random instances that you can actually build. Uh, explicitly, there's like a deterministic polynomial algorithm uh, to build this infinite family of, of high dimensional expanders that are sort of optimally hard for sum of squares. So we sort of have some structural understanding of uh, you know what is hard for the paradigm in this sense, and maybe I'll mention in terms of uh, why one other reason three XOR is particularly interesting. Uh, it also is uh, what's sort of classically used in so in the two to two games reduction that uses the Grassmann. It also reduces from hardness of three XOR. Um, so there are also sort of al uh, alternate reasons you might care in particular about these CSPs and and hardness of understanding hardness of three XOR uh, in, in in particular. Okay, I guess I have like five minutes. What is, how's my time? Uh, yeah, maybe we can extend by a few minutes if required. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to, I guess I at least want to sort of get through talking about what I mean when I say high dimensional expander here, because I think that it's a very useful notion that has seen a lot of study in math and has not been picked up in computer science. I think that it's uh, it's an extremely useful uh, extension of, of expander graphs that should apply uh, beyond this setting. And in fact, it already has. It ended up proving the NLTS conjecture, um, which I'll, I'll mention later on. But um, OK, so uh, what is the chain complex? So I'm saying I, I'm to, to prove this sort of better uh, lower bound for sum of squares, we have to move beyond the simplicial setting. Uh, for a reason I'll, I'll, I'll explain in a little bit. So chain complexes are sort of a classical generalization of simplicial complexes that come from algebraic topology, which means this slide is going to be a little bit of a disaster. Uh, don't worry about it. The next slide, I'll give sort of a simpler way to, to think about this, but I do want to go through the formal definitions. So a chain complex is made up of a family of sets, x0, x1, x2, just like a simplicial complex. Uh, and it'll have boundary maps or co-boundary maps between the uh, functions on the sets. So we'll have linear maps, delta 0 that maps from functions on x0 to functions on x1, and delta 1 that maps from functions on x1 to functions on x2. And we say this sequence of maps is a three-term chain complex if the composition of the linear maps is 0. Uh, identically, and everything we're doing here is over f2, so this is you know composition over f2, uh, et cetera. Everything's done over f2. Now, the classical uh, objects in this construction, so delta 0 and delta 1 are what are called the co-boundary operators. Um, the sort of important players in this type of construction are the image of delta zero, which are called the co-boundaries. Uh, there is the kernel of delta one, which are called co-cycles. And sort of the important thing to notice here is that because delta zero, delta one is equal to zero, anything that is mapped from below, anything that is the, in the image of delta zero is also in the kernel of delta one by definition of, of being a chain complex, right? This is what delta one, delta zero equals zero tells you. And so you can look at uh, the uh, you can look at zi the cocycles mod bi and this gives you something called the cohomology. 
this is not uh, too important, but if you try to read a paper in this type of area, this is what you'll see. Uh, and roughly speaking, a set in X1, we'll, we'll always basically be talking about the expansion of sets in, in X1. A set in X1 expands if its co-boundary is large. If the, if the Hamming weight of the application of this co-boundary offer delta E1 to the set 1s is large. Okay, all of these things, I, I think if you aren't familiar with algebraic topology or like homological algebra, don't really make any sense. Um, I mean, if you look at them for a bit, they do, but you know, in one minute in a talk, it's a little bit hard to grasp. So let me give you a different way to think about this that I think is, is much easier to interpret and also way more directly connected to CSPs. Um, so a totally equivalent way to think about chain complexes is through stacked by parts like graphs, which hopefully you should recognize from the construction that I just told you about of, of CSPs. Um, so in particular, a chain complex can be interpreted as a set of two bipartite graphs stacked on top of each other, x0, you know, one with you know, left side or, or bottom x0 and top x1, and delta 0, this operator that we talked about before. This is just the adjacency matrix of this bipartite graph. It's just a bipartite adjacency matrix. Uh, and then we have another graph on top of that, x1 to x2, uh, and the adjacency matrix is, is delta 1, the second co-boundary operator. And again, we call this sort of stacked pair of graphs a chain complex if the composition delta one delta, uh, delta zero is equal to zero mod two. If, in other words, the product of these adjacency matrices, uh, every input is even, every entry is even. So again, an, another a combinatorial way to think about this that I think is much simpler is your object is a chain complex if for every fixed element in the bottom of the complex and in the top of the complex, there is an even number of paths between them. Essentially things have to cancel mod two. Uh, okay. so. I said before that this is a generalization of simplicial complexes. I think it's worth taking a minute to see why, to understand this notion. Um, it's not particularly hard. All we have to do, based on what I just said, <clears throat> is look at the number of ways to get from an I set to an I plus two set. Let's look at, at one and three uh, as an example. Uh, it's basically exactly the same in any dimension. So there are two examples, right? Either, let's start at one. How many ways are there to get to two, three, four? Uh, you can't possibly get to two, three, four, because these edges are drawn by inclusion. So whenever you go up, you keep the sets that you had started with, right? So every time I go up, starting at one, my set will always have one in it. So it's impossible for me to get to two, three, four. So to go up to a set that uh, does not contain where I started, there are zero ways to do this. The other option is that I do contain the set that I started at. But then there are, uh, you know, how many other options? There are two other options, right? Between I and I plus two. There are exactly two ways to go up. Here I can either add two first or I can add four first. Uh, and, and these are the only possibilities. So there are either zero ways to move up or two ways to move up. And therefore by this equivalent characterization that I told you about, this is a chain complex. So this is sort of the way in which these are generalizations of, of chain complexes. Maybe I'll mention since I'm sort of running out of time, the reason that you might not want to use simplicial complexes is that simplicial complexes are sort of uh, can have very rich structure when you look up the complex. And there, there's sort of a lot of possibilities when you move up a level of where you can go. When you move down on a simplicial complex, remember that the simplicial complex is defined by downward closure. So it's, it's really, really constrained in what the structure can be. And uh, sort of the important part is that when we talk about uh, these connections with some squares lower bounds, and this is also very important for things like recent breakthroughs in, in quantum codes, uh, you sort of have to be expanding in both directions of the complex in some sense. And when you're on a simplicial object, um, I don't have a formal proof of this, but I, I, I very strongly think it's true that you can almost never be expanding well downwards because you have this downward closure structure. So it can be very helpful to move away from simple, simplicial complexes and to sort of more general chain complex structures to get sort of uh, bound behavior you, you need in these types of, of scenarios. Um, what, what do you mean by not be expanding downwards on a simplicial complex? Could you expand on that a bit? Um, so formally, what I mean is that, uh, let's see, what is, a, what is a good way to explain this? I mean, one, one thing you can notice is that like, there, just, there aren't many options going down, right? When you, when, you look at, uh, when you look at expansion, you want to be sort of spreading outwards, right? So, mm -hmm. Somehow in, in some vague notion, you want like your edge structure to be moving, to not be clustered, like moving outwards. But downward closure is like sort of exactly forcing this like uh, clustering on you. Like it's forcing you to sort of stay within sets instead of moving moving outwards. And this so is like in a, a combinatorial sense, it seems to be the set doesn't seem to be 
uh, giving too many edges out of the. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In like a yeah, in like a literal combinatorial sense, it sort of forces edges to move inward in some sense. And you can you can get around this a little bit, like you can sort of get like log amounts of expansion, but you can't get like uh, the same amount of sort of freedom and in, 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 in terms of expanding outwards as you can moving up the complex. Right? You can even sort of see this, and like if you just look at x zero, x one, x two here in this complex, it's sort of very obvious that you're like looking like you're expanding when you move up, and you're contracting when you move down. Right, sort of just at a very intuitive level. Um, it and doesn't I even that your x zero, x one, x two in the chain complex are arbitrary sets of size. Yes. Whatever. Yes. yes. <laughs> they will be sort of algebraic. Uh, in particular, the things that we use are these left-right Cayley complexes that uh, had these breakthroughs in, in quantum L to BC codes and, and things. But yeah, they will not be uh, sets of elements as, or, or they'll be not simplicial sets of elements at, at least. They'll not be downward closed. They don't be downward. Yeah, they will not be downward closed. Yeah. Or like there'll be like Tanner maps of these things. Uh, there's like a, there's always a bunch. It's it's very far from simplicial. They're like I think necessarily very far from simplicial. Um, I don't. Know. Although I you know take this with a grain of salt. I don't have a proof that you cannot be expanding in the downward direction. Um, so maybe I should I should try to prove that formally. Um, okay. So let me let me talk about a little bit what it means to be expanding in a complex. Uh, and then maybe we can finish up so that I don't, uh, you know, keep people for for way too long. So sorry for for going a little bit over, um, uh, but I do want to sort of talk about this notion of expansion because I, I think it's a very useful uh, notion. So what we'll generalize is something called the Cheeger constant, which is basically uh, the the edge expansion that we talked about before. So the Cheeger constants of uh, say a regular graph, I'm uh, killing normalization by degree a little bit here, but it's basically equal to the minimum over subsets of of vertices of a, a normalized version of your edge boundary, right? ESS bar is uh, counting the number of edges that crosses the sets. And then you're basically normalizing by size of the set up to complement. So this is like a classical definition of, of expansion in graphs that uh, has, has been very, very useful and widely used throughout both math and, and computer science. Um, what we'll be interested in is sort of how to view this as a statement about expansion on complexes. So the first thing that I want to notice is that there's another way to view this definition. In particular, uh, we can view this as saying that the edge boundary of a set scales with how far it is from the empty set or the entire vertex set. In other words, this equation holds the size of your cut is at least some constant times the distance of s from 0 or v. And the reason intuitively that this makes sense is that 0 and v are sort of the canonical examples here of non-expanding sets. Right, the entire vertex set is non-expanding because, by definition, all of the edges stay within the set. Is that it's the entire graph, and the empty set is not expanding because there are no edges. So, sort of in some trivial sense, these are like uh, the only you know should be the only examples of, of non-expanding sets. And you would sort of expect that, like, uh, ho hopefully, I'll sort of expand as long as I'm far away from these uh, canonical non-expanding examples. In this sense, it's very similar to what we were talking about before, with sort of links being uh, the canonical examples of non-expanding sets, and as long as you're far away from links being uh, well expanding. This is sort of a very similar way to view uh, Cheeger. Now, if we view G as a complex, there's a very natural way to talk about this, right? So we can view G, G as a complex where the, the bottom level is the empty set, and the first level is vertices, and the second level is, is edges, and these delta zeros are just given by the bipartite uh, adjacency matrices between them. Uh, and I want you to observe the following, which is sort of uh, actually why this delta one is called the boundary operator or the boundary operator. The number of edges crossing the cut between S and S bar is exactly the Hamming weight of delta one applied to the indicator of S. And the reason for this is just the definition of the biparts of the uh, adjacency matrix. What is delta one applied to one S of an edge? It's exactly the XOR of one S on V and one S on W. So this is exactly one when you cross the cut. Right, so the number of times it's one is exactly the number of edges that cross the cut. So this numerator term, or this term on the left, we can think of as sort of the size of the co-boundary of, of 1s. And then furthermore, uh, what's going on with this sort of empty set and v? Well, these are exactly the image of delta 0. These are the things that I call the co-boundaries. They're the functions that come from below. Why is this the case? Well, in this case, x0 is the empty set. Right. So when you sort of lift the empty set, the only thing you get are the constant functions. So you get all 0 or all 1. And these are the co-boundaries. And the reason that it sort of makes sense to say, uh, I want to say that like things expand as long as they're far away from the co-boundaries, is that the co-boundaries are classical sort of uh, the canonical examples of non-expanding non sets. 
because of the chain flux guarantee that delta zero composed with delta one is zero, right? If I take a function that's in the image of delta zero, when I map it through delta one, by definition of a chain complex, it has to be zero. So, so by definition, sort of this image of delta zero is exactly sort of this things that you can't hope will be expanding. These are always going to be non-expanding by the structure of the complex. And so what you sort of want to say is that my expansion is uh, proportional to how far away I am from these objects. So this leads to this very uh, natural generalization of Cheer that was uh, originally introduced by Lineal and uh, Mishulam and independently by Gromov, uh, sort of in the context of, of algebraic topology, uh, which is basically exactly just replacing uh, the edge boundary with delta 1, 1, s and the uh, distance from 0, v to distance from the boundary. So uh, a complex is called a row co-boundary expander if for all subsets in x1, the size of the co-boundary of, of s is at least row times its distance from the functions that come from below. Uh, this is sort of the typical definition of topological high dimensional expansion that's studied in the literature. Uh, and I'll mention, uh, and I was talking about this before on sort of uh, downward versus upward directions on simplicial complexes. Uh, it'll also be very important to talk about expansion in the opposite direction. So I've been calling these things the co-boundary operators. The reason that co is in front of them is that uh, Historically, in algebraic topology, you actually usually consider the operators going the other direction first, and these are called the boundary operators. And this is just, uh, you know, back in the adjacency matrix view, this is just sort of viewing the transpose of the bipartite adjacency operators, right? So you can either like walk up this or you can walk down it. There's sort of two natural directions you can go through, and we can talk about expansion in both directions. Uh, okay, so then uh, with that in mind, We'll say it's a row co-boundary expander if it sort of expands uh, going, I guess when we laid out this way, going up. We'll say that it's a row boundary expander if it expands in this fashion going down. Now let's recall our construction. Now sort of in chain complex language. So what did we had? We had these variables, we had the constraints, and then we had sort of these global checks that we wanted to satisfy. So now let's say that this thing is a chain complex. What does this sort of mean? Let's sort of re, uh, rehash what our construction is. How are we going to pick beta given sort of this knowledge of uh, this structure of the co-boundary operators delta zero and delta one? Well, the first thing to notice is that what are the satisfiable assignments? What are the sort of beta that I can pick that will end up with satisfiable instances of XOR? They're exactly the co-boundaries. They're, they're in one-to-one -one equivalence with functions that are coming from below. And this is because the definition of delta zero, right? The value of delta zero on say C2 is the XOR sum of X1, X3, and X5. Right? So if I want to know what sort of things are satisfiable and what the satisfying assignment is, it's just you, you, pick, you pick some assignment x, and then you map it up to the next level. That tells you exactly what the values on the constraints are. So uh, this is one way to sort of algebraically or linear algebraically define what the sort of set of satisfying constraints are. And now this sort of these global checks, this global structure that we're going to endow, this is going to be given by what I called earlier co-cycles, the kernel of delta 1, the things that map to 0. And the trick will be. I want to pick something that is far from being a satisfying assignment, right? So I want to pick something that is far from being in the image of delta zero, but I want it to have global structure. So I want it to be in the kernel of delta one. So what I'm going to pick is something in the kernel of delta one that's not in the image of delta zero. This is uh, sort of like picking something in the homology or picking something that is a, a cycle, but not a boundary, co-cycle, but not a boundary. Um, and I, I won't go through the exact math, but there is a deterministic polynomial time algorithm for finding such a beta, uh, assuming it exists. It can be found just by standard linear algebra techniques and like Gaussian elimination. So uh, if you can sort of construct this complex part explicitly, uh, this gives you like a fully explicit construction. Um, okay, so now it seems like we're done. We have our we have our definition of, of high dimensional expansion, right? We just need to, you know, it, it seems like it's a natural generalization of boundary expansion, which was exactly the type of property that was needed to prove uh, hardness of random instances of 3x or uh, so we're ready to go, uh, except there's a problem. This beta doesn't exist. Um, in particular, uh, co-boundary expansion is a very, very strong property, and it actually forces what's called the vanishing of cohomology. In particular, it implies that the kernel of delta 1 is equal to the image of delta 0. So there's no way to pick a function that is sort of global in some sense without it being satisfying, which is the major problem for this approach. The other problem is we don't know how to construct these objects. These are actually very, these co-boundary expanders are, are very important objects. They also have uh, implication, similar implications in like quantum and, and a bunch of other areas. And uh, we sort of have no idea how to construct them at the moment. Uh, but it turns out that both of these problems can be circumvented by a very simple relaxation, looking only at small sets. 
So instead of requiring this sort of expansion requirement to hold for all sets on your object that you should be expanding as long as you're far away from a, a boundary, we'll only require this to be true for small sets. So we'll, we'll define this notion of small set high dimensional expanders uh, to be these chain complexes that are uh, co both boundary and co-boundary expanders, but only for sets up to size of like row one uh, times the size of x one. So these are only, you know, these are, they only satisfy this type of isoparametric or uh, expansion inequality uh, if you're like one tenth the total size. You don't have to satisfy it for everything. Um, and the sort of main theorem here is that these objects actually exist. Uh, you can prove explicit uh, bounded degree constructions of small set high dimensional expanders. Um, I clearly don't have time to go through the construction. Uh, I shouldn't be talking at all at this point. Um, but it turns out that these are exactly uh, QLDPC codes. Uh, in particular, uh, if you look at sort of the quantum Tanner codes of Leverrier and Zemmour and sort of these breakthroughs on locally testable codes and quantum codes, if you mess with them a little bit, uh, you can prove this small set expansion type behavior on exactly the objects. You'd actually don't have to change them at all. So if you're familiar with this type of uh, QLDPC code, uh, that's exactly what this construction is. And uh, it's worth noting that these objects are not just useful in, in hardness of approximation. Um, it was also observed uh, a couple months after our work that uh, these objects are, are NLTS. They resolved some open problem in, in quantum complexity called the NLTS conjecture. Uh, and this was observed by Anshu, Bruckman, and Nerke. Um, OK, so these are very powerful objects. I'll say maybe one thing about why these, uh, I haven't sort of told you why this is helpful, and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish. Um, I'll, I'll be very quick about this. So uh, for soundness, I guess I'll just briefly say, so we need, to, we need to prove that these instances are far from satisfiable. Right, so we pick them to not be a co-boundary, and that means they're not satisfiable, but we need them to, to fail many constraints, like a linear fraction of constraints, not just you know, one constraint. And the idea here is basically that co-boundary expansion in some way promises that anything that is a co-cycle that is not a co-boundary must be really large. This is sort of promised by small set co-boundary expansion. In particular, the reason for this is that you can write the number of unsatisfied constraints as the Hamming weight of beta plus uh, you know, the number of unsatisfied constraints of, a, of an assignment X is exactly the Hamming weight of beta plus the co-boundary operator applied to X. And you can go through some basic arguments showing that small set co-boundary expansion implies this has to be large. And so this basically immediately gives you soundness. This is uh, not a hard uh, argument. Completeness is a little bit more challenging, but let me at least give the intuition, which actually relies a lot on this type of small set, uh, this relaxation to small sets. Roughly the idea is that, so what I, what I said before is that if you are a co-boundary expander, it kills your homology, right? It says that Z1, the, the co-cycles without co-boundaries don't exist if you're a co-boundary expander. Z1 is equal to B1. The idea here is that when you're a co-boundary expander for small sets, at a local level for, for up to like linear size sets, it still looks like Z1 is equal to B1, right? It still looks like the sort of all of the global structure that we're using, all of these are satisfiable. You can't tell that there exists this sort of large global structure that is very unsatisfiable. Because locally, it looks like you're a co-boundary expander. And so locally, it looks like you have no cohomology. So somehow, uh, what this is saying is, you know, at, at a local level, uh, this, this tricks algorithms that only look at some linear number of, uh, of variables, like some of squares. And there's some way to formalize this through connections with proof systems and various isoparametric inequalities. Uh, but, I'll, but I'll skip this. Really, the intuition is that uh, you sort of, the set of possible global options looks empty locally. And, and so it tricks some of squares. Um, I'll mention sort of the main differences with prior work here are really moving to this general non simplicial complex case and using these ideas of small set high dimensional expansion versus sort of weaker prior uh, isoparametric inequalities. Okay, I'm, I'm totally over, so I'm, I'm going to end here and just leave this slide up. Thanks so much for those of you who, who stuck around. Uh, sorry for going. Okay, so let's thank the speaker for the wonderful talk. And uh, I guess now we can take any questions. Okay, so I don't see any questions. So in that case, let's thank the speaker again. And uh, so Max, if you are around, let me stop the recording first. Okay.